small country can stand alone against a unified international community. It, it's just impossible. There are all kinds of ways yeah. of stopping them, and they need the economic support and the military support. That's a nice segue to Iraq, but I want to come back yeah. to other things. Well, you know, and Israel has been, has become, actually it goes back before 1976. Uh, the, in 1971, that's where the real split between the United States and the world begins on this. In 1971, the president of Egypt, newly new president of Egypt, the president Sadat, uh, offered Israel a full peace treaty in return for withdrawal from Egyptian territory. Uh, said nothing about the West Bank, uh, nothing about the Palestinians. A full peace treaty recognizing, incorporating the main UN resolution 242, so right. the right to live in peace and security and so on and so forth. Right. Everything. Uh, nothing about the refugees, just in return for withdrawal from Egyptian territory. Israel discussed it they knew that it was a possible, we have internal records and others, actually Yossi Balin wrote a, right. his doctoral dissertation was uh, in Hebrew about revealing a lot of the records and cabinet records and other discussions about this, but it was also in the public record. Now they dis had discussed the question, should they accept it? Now they had a choice, and it was a fateful choice. The choice was to accept peace with Egypt, it's the main military force, which would essentially end the military conflict. There were no other major Arab military forces. So accept peace with Egypt, uh, have a, still retain control of the occupied territories, have to do something about it. Because it wasn't uh, on the table. It wasn't on the table. Uh, uh, and integrate themselves somehow into the region. That was one choice. The other choice was to insist on expansion. And the crucial expansion at that time was not the West Bank. It was northeastern Sinai, Egyptian territory. They wanted to expand into northeastern Sinai, and there were big developments there, driving Bedouins out of their homes. And they were building a city, in fact, an old Jewish city in northeastern Sinai. Uh, that was a choice. That, if they made the second choice, as they did, that entailed dependency on the United States, because there was going to be a situation of permanent conflict. And that was the choice that was made. I think it was a very bad mistake. But my impression was, in, and I'm, again, my impression was that, that in fact, when we, we had the agreement between Egypt... 1978. Yeah. Well, see, that's, that's kind of the agreement was that, that, that no, the Israelis withdrew, and, the, yeah, and, then sub, and, and in fact, Arrow Sharon came in and cleaned up the settlements. Well, no, in, in northeastern Sinai. Right. Yeah, but see, am I right about that or wrong? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. The, uh, uh, but that's only half the story. Uh, by 1977, uh, what, the, what, what happened in 71 is the offer was made, Israel rejected it. The crucial question is what would the United States do? Well, there was an internal debate in the United States and it was won by Henry Kissinger, uh, whose view was, uh, as he described it, that we should keep to what he called stalemate, meaning no negotiations, just so force. Kissinger was opposed to an agreement in 1971 between right. Egypt and Israel, yes, in which would have led to the withdrawal from the Sinai. Exactly. Egypt would once again now, the reason have the Sinai and there be a real, uh, diplomatic relationship between the two countries. Yes, uh, and that decided the matter. Uh, the, this, which mm -hmm. you know, the way the U.S. goes sort of determines what happens. It's just okay. overwhelmingly <laughs> powerful. Now, when that led to a war. Uh, Sadat kept, 73. Yes, he kept saying, look, if you don't withdraw from the Sinai, there's going to be a war. Nobody believed him. Uh, nobody took it seriously. When the war, it, war did come in 73, and it was a huge shock. It was a close thing for Israel. Right, Actually, the yeah. U.S. ended up with well, a nuclear exactly. alert. All right, at that point, Kissinger recognized that you can't, that Egypt isn't a basket case. You can't just dismiss it. Then he began his shuttle diplomacy, and it goes on up to Camp David, finally, 78, right. 79. And at that point, Sadat, uh, it, it, the U.S. and Israel agreed to an offer that Sadat had presented in 1971, but the new one was harsher from the point of view of Israel and the United States than the original one. It would have been better off if you accepted 71 well, rather than the one that was better negotiated. Off from their point of view, which Carter, I don't accept. By Jimmy Carter, Ken yes, David. But, and but, so. See, but in 71, uh, there was nothing about the Palestinians. By 1977, the Palestinian issue was on the table. Uh, and uh, the U.S. and Israel had to accept an order, an offer which uh, recognized in some fashion Palestinian national rights, which they didn't want to do. I mean, I think they should have done it, so I can't say it's worse, but they didn't want it. 
Now, it's interesting that this is described in the United States as a uh, diplomatic triumph. In fact, it was a diplomatic catastrophe. If it had been accepted in 1971, would have spared well, the, I, the, I, I would, Jimmy Carter was here several days ago. I mean, he certainly thought it was the diplomatic triumph. He probably doesn't know the history. I mean, you, you should have asked him whether he knows what happened in the background. Well, if I'd had this interview before, yeah. I would have. Well, it's all on the public record. Yeah. You know, well, so, but I mean, but uh, but you know, this is one of the many things we have to learn about, and if, if we want to make to gain some understanding of what's really happening there. So when you ask questions about, say, Arafat, you know, unfortunately, all of this has to come in. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but what's interesting now? Let me let me make this point. I spoke to someone uh, about you today, and he said the following to me. Someone who many his views you would recommend, you would, would agree with, some not. Uh, he said to me that after complimenting your mind, the quality of the mind and, and um, contributions you had made, he said that what you had done is turned American exceptionalism on its back. And that you're, for all those who believed in American exceptionalism, you had believed in exactly the opposite whatever that is. Now, let me stay with this question. On the other hand, there are people who have asked you, look, if you have such strong feelings about how wrong-headed American policy has been, why don't you leave the country? A frequent sort of thing is thrown at people yes. who are critical frequently. And you always say, I love this country. Yeah, well, sure. right. I mean, it's a very interesting question. I mean, let's, let's try it on some other country. You know, it's sometimes easier to think about things clearly if we no, no, great, great. Now let's go back to say our the big enemy, Soviet Union. Right. I mean, the Russians would have been delighted to have uh, the dissidents leave the country. If Sakharov had been willing to come to the no. West, they would have applauded. What, does it make sense to tell, ask Sakharov why don't you leave it, the Soviet Union? I mean, I suppose no, I'm not trying to answer. You know I'm not asking that question. I'm but actually see, that's using the, that question that's the framework. to make the point that you've always that's said. That's the framework in which the country, the question should be understood. Right. It's assuming that you can't have a democratic society. You stay society. and fight for values because you love the country. And you, that think, that you, think, said, that the, you think that the country ought to live up to these values. And there are, you, know, you can't rank countries uh, A, B, C, D. Countries have all sorts of properties. There's a culture, there's a society, there's modes of interaction, and so on. A lot of the things that are, uh, are simply achievements. I mean, take, say, protection of free speech. Right. It's unique in the United States. There are a lot of great things that have been achieved. There are a lot of rotten things that have been done. If you, or if you have any concern about the country, meaning its people, its culture, and so on, you want to save and extend and amplify the achievements and modify the And, uh, and you would crimes. put the protection of free speech high up on that list. Of, Very high. And it's not the only one. Okay, but well, tell me more, and then we'll come to some of the criticisms cause, uh, that you have made about American imperialism and the like. See, that's, see we have to make a distinction between state power and a country. The different things. I, I understand the difference. Uh, but, but, but it's often not distinguished. If you criticize state policy, you're not criticizing a country. I understand that too. I mean, we, first of all, frequently when you're traveling around the world, as I do, you know, people say, I love, you know, America. Yeah, I'm just having hate a great, the policy. I hate the policy. Sure. And, if, and it's, we're responsible for the policy. It's a free country. We can't say, you know, I don't have any responsibility for the policy because we do. We may not know about it, but then we should find out about it. And if we decide we don't like it, we should change it. In fact, take a look at the question we've just been discussing, two-state settlement. Right. About two-thirds of the American population supports the international consensus on this and long Which has. Which is they ought to be a two-state solution. Uh, roughly the 67 right. borders. Right. And it's, it's kind of interesting to look at the polls. I mean, polls will, you find roughly two-thirds of the population saying, yeah, they support that. And roughly the same proportion says the U.S. ought to become more involved in the diplomacy. People don't know that that's a contradiction. The reason that that policy has, that program has not been achieved is because of consistent U.S. intervention to prevent it from being achieved. And that continues at this 